Okay, welcome everyone to an Ethical Corporation by Reuters Events webinar on regenerative pro approaches to climate action. I'm Terry Slavin, I'm the editor of Ethical Corporation, and I hope everyone is keeping well and safe in, in these very difficult times. Um, it's been estimated by scientists that taking a regenerative approach to managing forests, water, land can bring 28% of the necessary carbon savings by 2028. And companies are realizing that one cost-effective way to tackle the climate crisis is by restoring and regenerating and protecting the biodiversity of the planet. Now, if there's one lesson from COVID-19, um, which was caused by animal to human transmission, it is that man's increasing impact on nature could give rise to more pandemics in the future. So, uh, are, but are companies actually uh, scaling up these regenerative strategies? So to understand that and to understand what this actually means uh, and how it can be implemented um, in, in business. I'm delighted to welcome Mary Jane Melendez, who's uh, Chief Sustainability and Social Impact Officer at General Mills. Um, General Mills is uh, based in Minnesota and it makes um, brands, people are familiar, uh, Cheerios, Nature Valley, Hagen dazs Ice Cream, Old El Paso. Um, welcome, Mary Jane. Thanks for having me, Terry. Great to be here this morning. So, um, next 45 minutes, it's going to be a fireside chat between myself and Mary Jane. Um, there's the opportunity to ask questions uh, through the chat feature you'll see on your screens. Um, please do send these in and we'll aim to get them answered for you. So, um, Mary Jane, let's start by asking what is a regenerative strategy and, and how are you practicing it? Sure, Terry, that's a great question. Thanks so much for asking. Um, I think where I might start is to talk about uh, our ambition around regeneration and what that means to, to General Mills. And if I just jump into the slide here, before I answer that question directly, uh, can you let me know if you can see my screen advancing? Yep, yep. Great. So just uh, at a very high level, sustainability has been a very important uh, journey at General Mills. We had our first uh, chief sustainability officer appointed back in 2003. And what I'm excited to share with you today is our most recent public commitment to advance regenerative agriculture across a million acres of farmland in North America. And I want to give you a little bit of context on why this is important to General Mills. So we, we are a food company and our business is rooted in the earth. There are, uh, I think, not a lot of companies who actually can naturally regenerate through the way that they operate. When you think about the concept of regeneration, uh, with being so closely tied to Mother Nature, when, when there are threats to the planet, it, there are threats to uh, General Mills, it's a threat to our business. And so for us, this concept of regeneration is not only a, a business imperative, but it's a planetary imperative. And at General Mills, what we're doing right now is moving from this concept of sustainability to regeneration. And we think this is really important today because if you look across natural resources and the declining, the declining effect that we're seeing across farming communities, how, struggler, how farms are, are struggling today to be economically viable, to keep up with demand at the same time that we're seeing this increase in the need to feed a growing global population. And there are just a few stats that I would call out that for me as I've been in this role have been really eye-opening and heartbreaking to learn. So think about the fact that you know, on the planet, a third of our soils are depleted today. And that's a problem because 95% of our food comes from the soil or the fact that more than 40% of insect populations, including many pollinators, are in decline. At the same time, we're wasting more than a third of the edible food meant for human beings, while more than 800 million people are hungry. So for General Mills, there's nothing about the current situation, especially in light of COVID-19 and where we are today, that we want to sustain. And really what we're looking at is the power of nature to actually help regenerate not only natural resources, but to think about how we apply that to our business. So Terry, to answer your question at General Mills, we've just implemented something that we're calling a regenerative framework or a regeneration framework. And that is to be a force for good by regenerating the natural resources upon which we all depend. And we want to help accelerate planetary health, healthy living ecosystems and thriving farmers and communities to ensure that 
as a company, we have the natural resources needed to continue making food the world loves. And that making food the world loves in blue there is really, um, it's our new company purpose, which was just recently articulated. And, and I love the double meaning of not only, you know, food the, the world loves in terms of people, but also the world in terms of planet. So to really be thoughtful about how we're bringing to life our business operations. So Terry, let me just get into the how in terms of how we're looking to activate the strategy. We have three pillars that we're looking to bring regeneration to life across. The first is our leadership brand. So really working closely with brands like Cheerios, like Nature Valley and haagen to help them embed purpose and thread through sustainability in terms of how they're uh, growing ingredients, how their products are made, how we're thinking about transporting these products um, going forward. So really a lot of opportunities on the leadership brand side. I, I think about one perfect example, the company uh, General Mills has done a lot of work in in pollinator health and habitat restoration over the last few years. And we have this um, really um, wonderful mascot in Buzz the Bee on Honey Nut Cheerios. And boy, isn't there for, you know, an opportunity to think about how we leverage Buzz to help educate consumers around the importance of pollinators. So within um, our supply chain, which is the second pillar around activation, we're looking at moving from a sustainable supply chain to really a regenerative supply chain. And as we think about this, important elements that we are looking at are the opportunity to advance regenerative agriculture across our sourcing footprint globally, and really to look at that with an eye towards how do we target our most greenhouse gas intensive ingredient categories. And that's really important for General Mills. And I'll share with you uh, in a few slides why greenhouse gas um, reduction is important and how regenerative agriculture is a key lever to pull down our greenhouse gas footprint. Sorry, let's see what is. And uh, next is our, our employee base and really figuring out how we continue to engage our employees to be a force for good. At General Mills, we have a, a employee volunteers and rate of 83%. And in addition to serving as volunteers within their communities, we also wanna engage our employees to be a force for good uh, for the environment and for the planet um, overall. So Terry, maybe what I'll do is just stop there because um, I, I can't see, see you your screen right now or your face and just pause to see if you have a question here, if I should continue. Okay. Um Maybe if I can ask you, what led you to do this? Yeah, I think a, a couple things. One, we we know that again with how closely tied our business is to to the to the world. What we realized is that you know we take the outputs of Mother Nature, turn them into delicious products, and then they're marketed around the world. And as we have seen more extreme weather events, and have seen um, whether it's been uh, challenges in getting sugar beets over this past fall because of extreme weather um, in the in the northern states in the in the United States having to go outside of a um, you know the regular supply chain and actually get sugar from a different source because farmers were not able to get sugar beets out of the ground so for us this is a real um, we see real impact to our supply chain and to our ingredient stream and if we can't have a reliable and resilient supply chain we're not going to be able to make make food that the world loves and right now really needs. And so for us, it's about this business resilience, building building a resilient supply chain and, and starting in our supply chain and then threading that through across the organization over time. But it's really about helping to build that resilience um, for the long term. So can I ask you about the impact of COVID-19 on this strategy? Uh, is it, Are you having to roll it back or accelerate it or? What's Great question. I, I would say um, in, the, in the last 30 days, we have um, continued to accelerate at a pace that um, is, is much faster than where we have been historically, which has been really interesting. I actually think that you will see us um, not only continue to advance um, current commitments that we've made, but actually expand the work that we're doing in regenerative agriculture, which started out as a commitment to advanced regenerative agriculture across a million acres in North America. Even in the last two weeks, we have elevated that strategy to go beyond North America to other key regions where we're sourcing greenhouse gas intensive ingredients like cocoa. Uh, so I think that you will see an acceleration of this strategy from General Mills uh, in light of and coming out of COVID-19. So how many farmers do you have in your supply chain globally? 
So we actually we we buy, actually have a supply chain that we are buying directly from suppliers all over the world. There's thousands of suppliers within that supply chain, and we're buying everything from wheat to office furniture to uh, software um, within the farmer base. Gosh, that's a great question, Terry. I don't have that off the top of my head. What I can share with you is within the pilots that we are bringing to life to uh, advance regenerative agriculture across key ingredients like oats, like like wheat, like dairy, in our oat pilot uh, right now, and it's not every farmer. We, we buy from supply sheds. General Mills does not buy directly from farmers. And within the oat pilot that we kicked off about a year ago, we currently have 46 farmers and 50,000 uh, acres under management that are moving from either conventional practices or organic practices and moving to adopting regenerative agriculture practices on those farmscapes. So if you're looking for a million, did you say acres or hectares? A million acres. Acres, and that's by? 2030. 2030, okay. And how far, and you've only just started that, so you're? We, we have, we're about one year in, and uh, with the three pilots that we have activated across wheat, oats, and dairy, we have, a, we have just over 100,000 acres in transition today. So you even if you if it was only a hundred per year you'd be getting there you're on track yes we can it, correct and we would we're actually hoping that we can get more acres under management early earlier on in in the pilot year earlier on in the next decade because it does take farmers a few years to make that transition it's not like all of a sudden you decide to adopt regenerative agriculture practices and everything's healthy you're, you're really taking the time to help um, Mother Nature uh, to repair and rebuild natural resources and in the, in the pilots that we're um, bringing to life we're in these pilots and have partnerships with these farmers and our suppliers for uh, at least a period of three years. And, and maybe Terry what, what it might um, help me to do is provide some context here around why we're doing this and, and how we're actually activating on the regenerative agriculture if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 2015, General Mills made a commitment to reduce its greenhouse gas commitment by 28% by the year 2025. We have reduced our uh, footprint by 14% uh, since that commitment was made against a fiscal 10 baseline. And what I would call out here, I just want to bring attention um, here around our greenhouse gas footprint and where the majority of our greenhouse gases are coming from today. So I'll draw your attention to the green portion of, of the box in the chart. And that green portion represents agriculture and the transformation of uh, uh, the outputs of Mother Nature into key ingredients for our products. That represents 52% of our greenhouse gas footprint globally for General Mills. And for, for us, what's really important and what's what the opportunity with regenerative agriculture is, is that regenerative agriculture gives soil the, the power and ability to sequester carbon and actually pull in carbon from the atmosphere and in, in through the roots in the ground, which act as straws, taking that carbon in, nourish the network of life that's underneath. So again, for us, when you think about the size of our greenhouse gas footprint and that so much of that is coming from agriculture, that's really what is spurring us to work to ad advance regenerative agriculture across our sourcing footprint. And I think what's also important to, to mention is that we're not just doing regenerative agriculture anywhere, we're actually doing it within our supply shed. So, for example, the oat pilot that we've activated is in um, a, a place, North Dakota, Canada, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, where General Mills has been sourcing oats for many, many years. And so really looking to activate regenerative agriculture across those supply sheds. And maybe what I'll do is just talk a little bit about what regenerative agriculture is, what, what that, that means. That was Go my ahead. next question because we uh, we've had we've started to get a lot of questions in. One of them is one I was going to ask, and that's about uh, what exactly is organic. How does organic fit into regenerative? Yeah, great question. So regenerative agriculture is really a, a holistic method of farming that intentionally enhances and protects natural resources in farmers and farming communities. And you can see on the screen, if you look towards the, the right side of the screen, there are really six core principles of regenerative agriculture. 
and uh, I'll, I'll take through them quickly, understanding the context of your farm operation, so really understanding the climate that you're operating in, the soil type that you have, um, and, and there are sets of principles underneath these that farmers can activate, so it's not really a, a one-size-fits-all approach, it's really these principles and then underlying practices. Um, minimizing soil disturbance is very important. When, when soil is, when, when it's tilled and when it's disturbed, it releases carbon into the atmosphere and actually breaks down um, the microbiology of the soil, the microbiome in the soil. So it's really important that you minimize that disturbance. Maximizing crop diversity is also very important. And if you think about it, you know, nowhere in nature do you see a monoculture, but when you drive through farmlands, a lot of times in the US, what you see is, you know, acres and acres of, of only corn or only soybeans. And this whole idea of, of crop diversity is really important through regenerative agriculture. Keeping the soil covered is another important principle. It, soil needs a protectant, just like we need skin on our body, soil needs to be protected so it can keep those um, nutrients um, within the ground so it doesn't erode when there's heavy rainfall. Uh, maintaining a living root in the ground. I mentioned that whole concept of roots acting like straws and, and helping literally to take carbon out of the atmosphere, store it in the soil where it releases sugar that's actually feeding all of that microbiology within, within the soil. And I'm, I'm not sure if many people know this, but within every acre of living soil, there are more than 10,000 pounds of, of biology, microbiology in that soil. So it's just teeming with life. And then the last principle is about the integration of livestock. So when animals are back, brought back onto the land, what we see is um, more natural tilling, um, more fertilization. They um, can eat cover crops and then and really help to um, and, and actually be getting um, more, more nutrient dense foods when they're when they're grazing on these lands, not just dry feed, but they're actually eating live um, plants like clover, which has been really interesting to learn how farmers are implementing those practices. And Terry, to get to your question about the difference between organic and regenerative, there are, there are definitely differences. And what's been interesting in our pilot project is we have both conventional and organic farmers within the oat pilot that are moving to the adoption of regenerative practices. And there, there are two differences that I would call out. One, organic farming still uses a lot of tillage, where regenerative farming is really trying to minimize soil disturbance today and um, integrate you know things like cover crops or think about um, very different ways that you you plant crops going forward not just tilling up the ground and putting in seeds but really being um, thoughtful about different approaches to minimize soil disturbance the other piece that i would say is that um, organic farmers still use a lot of um, inputs they might be natural inputs whether it's a, a natural pesticide or a, a natural fertilizer and the regenerative agriculture actually minimizes um, inputs, um, especially, you know, it minimizes a lot of inputs overall and really helps to have Mother Nature restore more balance um, over time. So I would say that those are the biggest differences right now that we've seen between organic and regenerative agriculture. But you can have both. Both can be part of the regenerative. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, another question um, is about the, you know, what's the business, what's the business um, model for farmers? How are they incentivized to do this? What are the payback periods? Um, how are you getting farmers attracted to, to, to doing these methods for you? Yeah, that, that is a great question. And I would say uh, part of that has been with the outcomes that we're looking to achieve, which farmers are, are incredibly aligned on. So first and foremost, what we want to achieve here is farmer economic resilience. We cannot continue to um, have farmers, you know, sustain the, the, the economic uh, model that they have today. Um, in, in so many cases here in the U.S., farmers are actually losing money for every acre of corn or soybeans that they plant. It's not profitable. And what we want to do is really help them to, to reverse the trend there and actually put more money in, in their pockets. And, and we've seen some of that early on in the pilots. And again, we're only a year in, but as we went on um, with these farmers and did some soil sampling on their farms, what we realized is that right away they could dial back on synthetic inputs. And with the, the dollars that they saved there, a lot of these farmers actually took that savings and reinvested them in cover crops and have put cover crops on their farms uh, for the first time this year. So the farmer economic uh, resilience piece is very, very important. If it doesn't work for farmers economically, it's not going to, it, it just can't work. 
And I would say one of the, the model that General Mills has brought to life is we are actually paying for the training and technical assistance that these farmers will receive over the next three years. So they're not, they're not having to, to pay for the expertise. We actually are working with a partner here in the US called Understanding Ag. So there's a, a regenerative farmer, his name is Gabe Brown, who has a network of other regenerative farmers um, across the country and even in Canada that are providing the training and technical assistance, the coaching that these farmers are receiving. And that has been incredibly beneficial for it to be a farmer to farmer education approach. General Mills does not, we don't, we don't have farmers. We buy from farmers, we do, you know, and suppliers, but we don't have a, you know, farmers on staff. So it's really been important for other farmers to provide this level of, ex, you know, expertise and the training and the coaching over time. So we're funding that piece. Um, and we're, the, another piece that we're covering is we're actually paying for the measurement on these outcomes. So again, while we just started and we're just a year into this pilot, what we hope to see through these changes is improvements in soil health, increased biodiversity, both below the ground and above the ground, and improved water quality on these lands. And um, the, the training today or the, the measurement piece is, is rather expensive. And we're, we're working with a number of partners to not only, again, look at, you know, uh, measuring carbon so soil carbon sequestration or measuring biodiversity and the, the the wildlife and the bugs and and the birds that are on the on the land. So what we're hoping to do is right now these farms are really learning laboratories for us to continue to sh share out the the learnings, find what works, what doesn't, um, and really continue to learn and iterate from there. And at the same time, be making the business case for farmers that they can be more profitable and actually enhance their farmscape at the same time. Because this is quite a young science, isn't it? There's a the data for the CO2 sequestration of soil is quite is still fairly young, isn't it? Correct. Uh, there's another question about the scale of your farms um, who are taking part. I mean, uh, as the uh, Bill Loftus points out, that uh, large brands are known for having large scale farms using in their supply chain does this lend itself to i mean are you tailoring this to smaller scale farms or or does it work at a, a large scale as well uh, sorry terry you broke up did you ask me if it works only on small scale farms yeah do, is it i mean will you get these massive big farms involved in this or or are these kind of smaller family farms that might be interested in in doing this so let me give you one example, actually. It's a, it's a great um, next slide to show. This is the map of the farms that are currently engaged. And I had mentioned that we have 46 farmers. Um, so 46 farms across North Dakota, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan uh, that have, have made uh, the switch in year one to 50,000 acres that now have regenerative agriculture practices applied. I, I think that's, I think that's, um, pretty significant in year one. Um, again, they're not they're not right now converting all of their farm operations because they grow more things than just you know oats. But I do think that is possible to actually scale this. And boy, I, I hope we can do it far beyond just the million acres that we have committed to as a company, but that we can actually continue to share what we're learning through this process. Um, hopefully, you know, be able to demonstrate farmers are more profitable that soil health is improved, that biodiversity increases, that water quality um, is, is improved, and that hopefully that will be, you know, a tipping point or provide some inspiration for other farmers to make those changes as well. So for us, these are 46 learning laboratories and hopefully 46 business cases that we can share with the world in terms of what's possible and what we have learned over time. Um, another question about uh, partnerships this approach who are you partnering with are you are, are you actually talking to other competitors I, I know that Danone for example is is involved in this as well we are we're actually talking to several uh, other food companies who are exploring uh, regenerative agriculture and, re and really it's about moving from sustainably sourcing which a lot of companies have, have done for a long time and, and that definition can be different depending on who you you know what companies you speak to to really looking at you know is is there a, a better way to um 
you know, to manage uh, farmscapes and to improve farmer profitability. So on a, yes, pre-competitively, we have been talking about, are there ways that we can engage and um, really help to advance this practice? Because we, we don't want it to be something that General Mills owns, and we think this is something that is good for people and planet. So really excited about the opportunity to continue to build out these, these partnerships. Today, we're working with um, organizations I mentioned, Understanding Ag, um, Applied Ecological Services is one of our measurement partners. We're working with the University of South Dakota um, in, in Kansas, where we have a, a wheat pilot. We're working with um, the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment, who's actually come to the table because they actually see the potential of regenerative agriculture to advance um, water quality issues that they have in that in that state. So it's been interesting to see, you know, partners can partnerships continue to evolve and um, connection points, um, like, like I said, with Kansas City, the, the Kansas Department of Health and Education, which wasn't how we stepped into that, that partnership or wasn't how we had architected that pilot. They actually had reached out and said, hey, we think there might be an opportunity to collaborate here. And it's been wonderful to have these partners at the table. Um, another question about the cost uh, ingredients. Will these practices lead to um, higher cost of ingredients? And, and actually, are we paying too little for food anyway? <laughs> that is that is such a great question. Um, uh, depend, probably depends on who you talk to and, and what food and, and, and what it is. I, I do think um, for General Mills, we, we have not yet seen an increase in the cost of the ingredients. Again, what we're doing is we're paying for the training and the technical assistance. And hopefully what, what, what we, we see what's different is that farmers are more profitable out of this process and that their farmscapes are, are more resilient, more regenerative over time. Um, and that that's where they're really, you know, being able to see to see that value. And, and today, again, what we are not doing is we are not paying um, a, a premium. We're we're not paying farmers directly. We don't buy from farmers directly. We work in partnership with suppliers who aggregate, you know, lots of oats or lots of wheat from several farms in in different sourcing footprints. Um, and again, have not have not seen an increase from them. And again, we're, we're in year one. Um, so it will be interesting to learn how the how the um, economics play out over time. I guess yes. So so there'll be a smaller part of the aggregated, and and yeah, there'll be a less direct impact on on prices. Um, one question I had about the pollinators issue because I, I you mentioned pollinators and I understand that there's been a big issue uh, or concern in the wake of COVID nineteen that that pollinators aren't, I mean, there's big transportation industry in getting pollinators around the country, isn't there? And that there's been a lack of, there's been a crisis in getting pollinators to the right places. Have you, have you, have you experienced, or are you viewing any knowledge of that? Yes, actually, we've, we've been watching, um, sadly, since I think about 2006, just the um, extreme decline of pollinators and, and um, their, ha their habitat, the loss of their habitat. And I actually think it's, you know, I, I think it's sad today that we actually have to ship, you know, bees and colonies across the country because um, we, in some regions and geographies, we don't have enough pollinators. And what I think is really uh, an exciting opportunity with regenerative agriculture is that you are restoring you know, natural habitat where pollinators can thrive um, because there's less synthetic inputs, because there's uh, more diversity within crops that are being grown. Uh, maybe there's more cover crops and just more places for them to, um, to live and they don't have to, to go so far to, to find food and to continue to, to you know, nourish the colonies. So I, I do think it's been, um, you know, it's been a, a heartbreaking, you know, situation to watch as pollinators have continued to decline as, as habitats are, you know, whether that's being converted for agricultural land or um, have just been degraded. I think there's a great opportunity within regenerative agriculture to restore that natural habitat where pollinators really can thrive. I think it's another promising potential aspect of regenerative agriculture. And how long will it take, do you think, to be able to measure to the the extent to which this has resulted in 
So, so right now our early hypothesis is, and, and we're doing these pilots, as I mentioned, they are three year uh, pilots where we're covering the funding and providing the training and technical assistance to farmers. I would say, again, uh, you know, there's been some interesting learnings in year one, like the, you know, dialing back of synthetic inputs uh, in the first year, which is good. And I think that's a positive for pollinators for sure. And uh, again, it, we, we don't see that it will happen overnight, but we hope by year three, we're starting to see some pretty um, significant uh, changes. One thing that I will sh share that was really interesting this year when um, our team was in some of these farmers in, in North Dakota and doing bug scans and looking at um, the amount of, of biodiversity on some of these fields that in year one had made a switch and then going and doing the same measurement on farms that were not part of the regenerative pilot but are, are control farms. And e even in year one, just the difference between the amount of bugs in one area that still had conventional farming practices and the one that had just in year one work to start up to apply some of the regenerative practices. It, it, and again, this was a, a sample size of just a few this year, but interesting um, what, what we're seeing. Not sure if it's going to be a trend, but interesting observations coming out of some of those uh, measurement uh, practices that we're bringing to life this year. Sounds really interesting. Um, uh, what other countries, you mentioned branching out to other countries, what, where are you looking to expand this? So I, I think for us, again, this is this is very early on, but we, we have an opportunity to look at dairy not only in uh, the U.S., where we have a pilot right now in Michigan, but also looking at dairy in Europe, where we buy uh, a lot of milk for our haagen ice cream uh, that is actually made in France. I think we also will have some opportunity to look at where we source cocoa um, in West Africa. So a lot of opportunities to, again, look at those ingredient categories that are very um, greenhouse gas intensive to see where we might be able to look at activating regenerative agriculture. And the other thing that I would just mention is that it, it might not be a simple you know, lift and shift of the practices and principles we talked about here today. I think it's really about, again, understanding the context of the operation, understanding um, where the farmers are, understanding that there are other factors, whether it be poverty, lack of resources, um, and, and really, I think, being open to a, a learning approach as we, as we look to bring some of those agricultural practices and understanding how they can fit within the broader context of not only that ingredient stream, but the communities that we're sourcing from and the people who are growing those ingredients. You mentioned cocoa, so that's presumably you're talking about West Africa, are you? Do you... That's correct. Hmm. That, that will be quite a different um, environment to be bringing in these practices than in the U.S. Midwest. That's exactly right. And, and, and one of the, the big differences there as we consider that to be a place where we could activate regenerative agriculture is, you know, deforestation, reforestation, conservation, protection, um, lots of other, you know, really, really uh, key issues to consider because some of those supply chains are, are just more fragile. So in the, I'm just wondering what regulation could help you here. Um, in the US, you're seeing a weakening of environmental regulation and particularly in the wake of COVID-19, you've seen um, not even being, what, what's left not even being um, implemented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what would really help? What, what would you like to see that would really help to, to, to bring this to scale? Um, I, I think for sure we could we could be thoughtful about um, not continuing to pay farmers to leave fields empty. I think we could also be thoughtful about paying farmers and incentivizing them to advance conservation practices or some of these agricultural practices. One of the, the things that General Mills is a part of is something called the Ecosystem Services Market, and it's in, in partnership with about 50 other partners, including the Nature Conservancy, um, Cargill, uh, several other partners that are looking to, to stand up a market that would uh, pay farmers for conservation practices and actually stand up a market where they're creating, um, you know, carbon credits that could be, you know, companies could use to offset their, their greenhouse gas footprint. Um, a lot of work to still be done there. And we're right now in the process where there's a lot of 
protocols and practices that are being piloted to actually prove out the science to get the data to to show that you know for example um, soil does sequester carbon and here's what that looks like and um, really proud of the work that's been advanced there's still a lot of work to do and the timing there is is right now the goal is to have that market um, stood up and available by 2022. So, so they're saying that uh, trees, carbon sequestration through trees, the cost of a, a ton of CO2 equivalent is well, five or ten, ten dollars a ton. What, what about what about with soil? What, what's the carbon sequestration value there? Do you think? Boy, that, that's a great question. I don't have the answer to that. We're part of uh, several conversations around um, carbon pricing today. And uh, I, I think that's still, boy, if we can if we can crack that and figure that out, I think that will propel so much action when there's a dollar value assigned. It's just not quite there there today, but we're, we're certainly part of the conversations to figure out how, how you advance that and how you help to put that, that price on, on carbon and soil carbon in particular. I wonder, you mentioned about um, paying, not paying, is it, what, what were you saying about paying farmers not to farm or to set aside land? And I'm thinking of the carbon, yeah. Yeah, no, I was I was talking about, um, and, and I was remembering actually uh, uh, an experience this past July, we, we took about 50 employees out to visit a regenerative farm in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. And I remember it, they, we had a very heavy rain the evening before. And once we got out of the city, it was um, pretty heartbreaking as we looked at farm after farm with water sitting on it, many, many farms that were not even planted. And um, when we, I remember all of a sudden pulling up to Redwood Falls, Minnesota, and, and it reminded me of the Wizard of Oz, just rolling green um, acres um, and uh, just a beautifully um, thriving regenerative farm. And the farmer that we had talked to had had shared with us that one, um, some farmers, there, there was an incentive to not um, plant in certain areas. Uh, and, and that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to us because there's you know land there. And again, soil that was completely exposed that um, had not been used to actually grow food that the world needs or grow ingredients that the world needs. And then they had also talked about so many of these farmers that had not been able to get into their fields because there have been such heavy rains this year. So again, you kind of look at this, the dire state of what some of these farmers have been facing because of the extreme weather patterns that they're dealing with. And again, I think that regenerative agriculture can be one of many very powerful levers to help, you know, make progress towards planetary health and hopefully reverse some of these trends and help help these farmers to in their operations to be more resilient to these extreme weather patterns. There's a question about um, mapping to the SDGs, which is something um, that seems to be, a, you know, I know, I know this is a very hot topic in for European con countries, companies, and perhaps less so in US com companies. Is that, uh, I mean, do you map, do you map your sustainability um, initiatives to the SDGs? We do. We actually map to and, and match to, I think it's about 50% of the goals today we we map to, whether it be, um, uh, you know, the climate action or whether it be life on land. Um, there's some uh, tied to human rights as well. So General Mills today with our sustainability efforts uh, map to today, I believe it's 50% of those goals. And how much this this regenerative land? How many how many goals does that hit? Oh gosh, I wish I had them in front of me, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, quite a few. I believe quite a few, especially as you think about again, you know, climate change, water, life on land. Um, again, human rights when it comes to farmers and livelihoods. Uh, I, I believe quite a few. If I were to able to, if I were able to pick up our global sustainability report. Uh, global responsibility report right now it's 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 in there in, in public information and if there's a follow-up here we can certainly include that information um also uh, i guess a question about um you mentioned water to what extent does water conservation fit into this is there is recycling gray water recycling that kind of thing is that part of the regenerative land approach 
Yeah, so actually water water is a is a new um, element that we just added actually within the last 90 days on the outcomes approach here because of what we're seeing in terms of um, healthier soils actually holding uh, more water water on the land and, and being more resilient during times of drought. And one of the things that um, we hear from whether it's you know Department of Transportation or um, uh, lo more uh, local municipalities is that a lot of times water from uh, runoff from farms and water that's coming off of agricultural lands um, is actually um, degrading infrastructures, whether it's roads or bridges. And then the cycle is that there's a lot of um, reinvestment that has to happen to continue to uh, reinvest to repair those roads, repair those bridges, the disruption it causes to communities when roads are closed. So what we what we hope to to be able to learn or to see or or you know maybe even prove out through this is that healthier soils and more resilient farmland have more water holding capacity and then better filter. Uh, nutrients and hold more of those on the land and, and keep them rather out of water waterways and in the soil. So again, as, as our results from our pilots um, continue to come to life, and, and the first set uh, we believe is going to be published this fall, and all of this will be you know, made public. And we're, it, again, this is a learning laboratory for General Mills, and we absolutely want to share with the world what we're learning, what we're seeing, what is working, what are challenges, um, what are things that we have to change because maybe something didn't work. Um, so hopefully be able to have more information on, you know, does does the regenerative agriculture practices, what does it do for water quality and water quantity and what are we seeing actually happen on the farmscape? So hopefully moving away from maybe theory to actual showing, to showing actually practically what happens on the farms. Okay, um, Mary Jane, I know you've, you've got to fly. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, so that's probably a, a good point to wrap up um, and to thank you very, very much for um, your time with us and really interesting, really interesting session um, on regenerative agriculture. Thank you, Terry, for having me today. It was a pleasure to connect with you and share a little bit about the work that we're starting at General Mills on regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll be looking forward to hearing more, you know, as your results come in. Absolutely. We'll look forward to sharing that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.